But anyway, right now we're going to dig deeper into the Gospels. That's what we're going to do. We want to go real deep. And what we'll be talking about today is the parables. When you hear the word parable, what do you think of? How would you define a parable? Well, let me say this. Parables were commonplace during the time of Yeshua, and parables are to be considered more illustrations, not riddles. When you think of a riddle, that means it's something hard to figure out. A parable was an illustration to make it easy to understand. It's just the opposite of uh, a riddle. The parables were to make truths easier to understand, not to make them harder. Some of the early church fathers thought that Yeshua was trying to hide his message by cleverly concealing the truth, rather just the opposite. He wanted them to so understand it that they, uh uh-oh, now I have to make a decision. Am I going to do what he says or not? Uh, you You know, it's just like when it comes to choosing uh, to become saved or whatever you want to call it. We come to a point where we have to decide. Not deciding is a decision. In uh, Matthew, look at Matthew 13, verse 34 and 35. It says, all these things Yeshua spoke to the multitude in what? Parables. And it says, without a parable, he didn't speak to them. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. So in other words, when he says he's going to speak in parables, speaking things that were kept secret, he's going to say that things that were kept secret, he's now going to make them available for everyone to understand. So he's using a parable to make them understand what had been kept secret. Well, when it says spoken by the prophet, which prophet do we find that this is referring to? Like I said, there's nothing new in the New Testament. The New Testament is full of connections to the Old Testament, and they're trying to reveal what it meant. It's from Psalm 78. It wasn't from one of the prophet prophets. It's a Psalm of Asaph, it says. And look at what it says. It says, give ear, O my people. He's not telling the lost. He's not telling the heathen. He's not telling the pagans. He's telling his own people to listen to the Torah. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Here it is. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter the dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us, and we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come. When it says the generation to come in Hebrew, the word is acharon, and it means this applies to the last generation, the terminal generation. So this is applying to us. And he says the praises of the Lord, his strength, his wonderful works that he's done. He's established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a Torah in Israel which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children that the generation to come might know them. That is saying that we today, the last generation might know to follow Torah. That's what this is saying. Do you get that? We are the generation that's supposed to return back to the Torah to understand God's heart, God's character. And then it says, even the children that will be born who would arise and declare them to their children that they might set their hope in God, not forget the works of God, but do what? Keep his commandments. It might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. So it's the terminal generation that is supposed to learn we need to keep his commandments. Now look at Mark 4, 9 and 10. And he said to them, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Where do we hear those verses? Revelation. All through Revelation, when he speaks to the seven churches, which are supposed to be his people, he says, Shema, hear and what? Obey. See, in English, we see the word hear. But how many of you have told your kids, I go dump the trash? And they go, I heard you. I heard you. And you, I don't want you to hear me. I want you to do it. And so here it says, 
when he was alone, his disciples came to him and they asked him about this certain parable. And look what he says. And he said to them, you don't know this parable? How then would you know any parable? If you don't know the parable of the sower with the seed falling on the different types of soil, you're not going to understand any parable. This is supposed to be the easiest parable to understand. What does the seed represent? The word of God. Exactly. Well, look at Mark 4, 33 and 34. It says, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he didn't speak to them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. So that means from the Hebraic mindset, we have to understand what a parable is. Okay. And they're not to hide things. It's to reveal things. I could give you some real good examples uh, externally from the word of God, but we'll, let's stick here with the word of God for the moment. And we're going to come back to the parable of the sower. But let's jump to Mark for a minute, because if you'll notice, Mark 33 and 34, he's talking about the parables. And then the very next verses, something is happening. So let's connect this to the parables too. And Mark 4, 36 through 31 it says, when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. Now, how many of you read this story before? But I want you to think about something. He is in the ship. Now, I don't know how many of you ever been out on the ocean, uh, either salmon fishing or halibut fishing or whatever. But how many of you like to be fishing in these kind of waters? Okay, it's like, oh my gosh, and you can see sometimes these, even these giant ship liners in the ocean, it's just like they're going way up and crashing down again and up and crashing down again. And it says there was a ship that he was in and a bunch of little ships. Okay, so think of this, he's in a big ship and there's a whole bunch of little ships that are around him, right? And look at this, there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship, which means the waves are so high, they're going into the big ship. What are they doing to the little ships? If these waves are going into the big ship, what's happening to all the little ships? It says there arose a great storm of wind, the waves beat into the ship so that the big ship was now full. And he was in the back part of the ship asleep and they awoke him and they said to him, Master, don't you care? that we perish? Why are they saying that? Because every one of the little ships are perishing. And they're thinking, wow, you don't care about all the people in the little ship, but oh my goodness, what about us, Lord? Don't you care about us that we're also gonna perish? And what did he do? He stood up, he rebuked the wind, and then he speaks to the water. And he goes, be at peace, be still. And all of a sudden, everything is just instantly calm. And it's like, oh my gosh, the wind stopped. There was a great calm. And then he says to them, why are you so afraid? Don't you have any faith? But what did they do? They feared even more. And they said to one another, who in the world is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Guess what? This was like a parable. Did you know these verses are in the Psalms? Look at Psalms 107, verse 23 through 20, 31. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in the great waters, they see the works of the Lord, his wonders in the deep. He's the one who commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves. They mount up to heaven. They go down again to the depths and their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro. They stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. And then they cry to the Lord in their trouble. He brings them out of their distress. He makes the storm a calm so that the waves are still. Oh, then they're very glad because they be quiet. And so he brings them to their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and his wonderful works to the children of men. Can you imagine what he's doing? He's telling them, I am the Lord your God. You're going through this. They knew the Psalms. They were hymns. They were songs. And here this happens 
And they know Psalm 78 and they go, wow, this is the yud heh vav hey. This is the Lord. Now, watch this. Matthew 4, 19, he's gathering his disciples and he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of what? Men. So when he talks about they're to catch fish and now they're to catch men, that is a parable likening something. So when he says, I want you to be fishermen, but now you're going to catch men instead of fish. As a matter of fact, in Exodus, when it talks about the children of Israel were multiplying exceedingly, in Hebrew, it says they were multiplying like fish. How many of you know chill people are compared to fish? What's the Christian symbol? A fish. Okay. Now, when he says he's going to make them fishers of men, like I said, there's nothing new in the New Testament. It's just a parable. I would say the New Testament is a parable of the Old Testament. That's what it is. It's explaining what the Old Testament is about. It's not something different. Look at Jeremiah 16, 16. God says, behold, I'm going to send for many fishers and they will fish them. Or is he talking about fish? No, he's talking about people. And he says, and after that, I will send for many hunters and they will hunt them from every mountain, from every hill and out of the holes of the rock. Okay, so what's going on in this verse? God what are the three feasts that every Jew had to be in Jerusalem for? What was the first feast everyone had to be in Jerusalem for? Passover. And what comes after Passover? Pentecost. Okay, Shavuot, and then Tabernacles. Passover was fulfilled when Messiah died. Shavuot or Pentecost was fulfilled when the Spirit was poured out. But the fall feasts have not yet been totally fulfilled. They have the Feast of Tabernacles and the Fall Feast. Messiah wanted all the Jews to witness his death. He wanted all the Jews to witness uh, the Shavuot, the Spirit being poured out, and he wants all to witness his return. Therefore, what is happening uh, right here in this uh, verse, we see that the Lord wants all the Jews in Jerusalem for the end times in Israel. And so first, people are going to fish them back to Israel, and then God is going to have Islam or Muslims and people who hate Jews to chase them back, to hunt them back, to get them back in Israel. One way or another, God's going to get all the Jews back in Israel. Either he's going to fish them back or that he's going to chase them back because that's where he wants them to be. As a matter of fact, this is in the Quran. This Quran says, even the rocks will cry out, here is a Jew, come and kill him. That's in the Quran. Now, here's the thing uh, that I think uh, is amazing. Now, something I want to point out back just a minute. In John 21, 7 through 11, just go back a couple of verses. Remember they, when uh, they were in the ship? Uh, let's look at this verse. I think I may even have skipped it. Okay, let's look at John 21, 7 through 11. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and that's John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he got his fisher's coat on him and he cast himself into the sea and the other disciples came in a little ship for they were not far from land, about 200 cubits. And they were dragging this net full of fishes. And it says, as soon then as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals and there was fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring of the fish which you have now caught. So Simon Peter went up and drew the net and he landed full of great fishes, 153. There were so many, yet the net wasn't broken. Okay, here's what, why did it say 153? Why didn't it say 152? Why didn't it say 142? Does anybody know why it says 153? Why did they give the amount? That, that's how many fish they caught. Oh, how many species? Oh, yeah, I have no idea. But what, the important point of that, though, is they were clean and unclean fish. Okay? A lot of different species. So it was like Jew and Gentile. When you think of fish being people, and there's all kinds of fish, that means this net was full of Jews and Gentiles. Are you following me? But why the number 153? 
I will tell you why the number 153. If you remember, just like Roman numerals, a V is five and X is 10. In Hebrew, every letter is also a number. Okay, this has just happened after Passover. Okay, he died and now he's risen from the dead. And this is during what's called the counting of the Omer, the 40 days from first fruits to Shavuot or Pentecost. So this is happening in that time frame. Well, guess what? The phrase, I am the Lord your God, in Hebrew is Ani Yudhe Vavhe Elohika, which means your God. Well, guess what? He is telling them, I am the Lord your God. Remember Doubting Thomas? He goes, oh, You are my Lord and my God. Well, guess what? The numerical value of these letters, this is 20, you just 10, that's the final cough, 20. You just 10, hey is five, Lamed is 30, Aleph is one. And then here again, this uh, is 26. And here are 10, 50, and one. The phrase, I am the Lord your God, you add those up, you get 153. Why the 153 fish? Because he's saying, I am the Lord your God. You're not gonna get this in English. You're only gonna get this through the Hebrew. Now, here's what is completely mind-blowing about this. Now, this is part of my book that I wrote. And these next two verses are in your notes, but you can write them down. I'm going to show them to you. This is a revelation I got like this morning, yesterday, right from the Lord. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Now, those of you that are new may not catch this as most of you who have followed it along. But how many times do you read the Bible and then all of a sudden something pops out? And then another day, something else pops out. And all of a sudden, the whole thing opens up. And it's like, oh my word, how did I miss that? Okay, I talk about this in my book and you know it, but in Numbers chapter 10, they had already spent an entire year around Mount Sinai after Egypt. And God said, okay, you've rested, you had your year vacation. It's time to get up and we're gonna leave, but we're going to war. And if you're gonna go to war, you better be organized. So around Moses' tabernacle, all the tribes were in a particular order. East went first and then went the south and then the west and then the north. And I want you to think in terms of them being in the military. You know how the military, when they're doing their march, they're all marching all in perfect matching, you know, simultaneously. Think of Israel marching that way because they're now going to war. And he says, they first took their journey according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. And in first place, with the standard of the camp of the children of Judah. They were on the east side and Judah was the captain. And according to their what? Armies. This, these are armies that are about to go take the promised land. And over his host was Nakshon, the son of Amminadab. Why was Nakshon the first of the first? He's the first one who jumped in the Red Sea. When Moses raised his rod, the Red Sea did not part until Nakshon jumped in. Okay. Now, in the same chapter, we're dropping to the end of the chapter, and it says, it came to pass when the ark set forward, Moses said, rise up, Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. Now, look at the chart here. The sages say that this one verse should be a whole separate book of the Bible, a sixth book. Nowhere in the Bible does this happen like a parenthesis around a sentence or a paragraph. There are two upside down Hebrew letter noon. There's one here and there's one at the end. So it's kind of like a parenthesis, okay, on both sides. Now, what does the letter noon represent in Hebrew? Fish. And what are we talking about? Fish and fish are people. But if you have two letter noon to represent a fish upside down and backwards, that means two dead fish. Okay, now you're, again, you're not gonna see this in the English Bible, but they're in the Hebrew. And so they say, now I don't mean uh, the Jewish people, but the Jewish people that are believers see this. They're going to war. The first letter noon, a dead fish, refers Rise up, O Lord, to the resurrection of the Messiah that will come. 
And the last upside down noon represents the believer who will be resurrected at his return. Now, what's amazing about that? What is the numerical value of the letter noon? 50. Okay, so here's a letter noon that's 50. Here's a letter noon that's 50. Now, get a load of this. 50, what do you, when you hear the word 50, what do you think of? Jubilee, the year of Jubilee. It's 50th year is the year of Jubilee, right? Now, here's what hit me. When was the last Jubilee? Okay, last year, okay. 1973 was the year of Jubilee. No, you're right, you're right though too. 1973 was the year of Jubilee. What day do you proclaim the year of Jubilee? What day? Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, you declare the year of Jubilee. That is the first day of the year of Jubilee. Well, guess what happened in 1973? The Yom Kippur War. The Yom Kippur War happened on the very first day of the year of Jubilee. The Jubilee is 50 years. 1973 and 50 is what? 1923. Last year is when the Jubilee year ended. And the last day of the year of Jubilee was the Iron Swords War when Israel was attacked. So here you have a Jubilee cycle bookended with upside down letter noons. And we just went through a Jubilee cycle with war on either end, the first and the back. This last Jubilee cycle, I believe, is representative of this. And we're about to see the resurrection of the dead now. We are that generation that's going to see Numbers 10 happen. Do you see that? Do you understand what I'm saying here? Here you have the Yom Kippur War representing the first upside down noon. And then you have the iron swords war. So here you have the first one where it says, rise up, O Lord, refers to the resurrection of the dead to, or the resurrection of the Messiah. And now we see the resurrection of the believers as when it says, return, O Lord. It's all right there. And I, I mentioned this whole verse in my uh, new book that's coming out. Uh, and so we've got to get ready. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, here we go. Here's an example of another parable. Listen to Matthew 22, 19 through 21. Yeshua says, show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said to them, Who image, whose image and superscription is on this? And they said, well, it's Caesar's. And he said to them, well, give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and unto God the things that are God's. Okay, this coin has the image of Caesar. So who does it belong to? Caesar. But if God's image is on something, who does it belong to? Whose image is on you? The world's image or God's image? We need to know whose image has been stamped on us. An earthly king stamps every coin with his image and all the coins look exactly alike, but not with God. He has stamped his image on every human being and there's not a single human being who is exactly like the other. Let me give you another example about whose image is on you. There's a story of a rabbi. He was the son of a rabbi and he was even coming from the house of his Torah teacher. He was riding leisurely on his donkey by the river and he was so glad because he had studied so much Torah and he was so smart. He passed a peasant man who was walking, who was just a day laborer, who was exceedingly ugly. And the peasant looked up with a smile and said, Shalom, rabbi. But the rabbi responded, Oh my, how ugly you are. Is everyone in your town so ugly? And the man replied, I don't know, but go and tell the craftsman who made me what an ugly vessel he has made. <laughs> and with that, the rabbi leapt off his donkey, prostrated himself on the ground before him and begged the man for forgiveness. 
So here we have the lofty scholar crossing paths with one who doesn't know Torah, and yet who had more wisdom? Now, Matthew chapter 13, verse 1 through 4. Here it says, the same day Yeshua goes out of a house and he sat by the seaside and a great multitude were coming around him. So he decided to go get in a ship and sat down and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And then it says, he spoke many things unto them in what? So is he trying to make it easier to understand or harder to understand? Easier to understand. And so here we have the big story of the sower who went forth to sow. Now, I have a little picture of the stony ground. Here's the seed that falls on the stony ground. And it says in Matthew 13, 5 and 6, some fell on stony places where there wasn't much earth and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched and because they had no root, they withered away. Well, again, he got this from Hosea. Look at Hosea 10, verse 12. Here we're talking about sowing seed. And here it says, sow yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground for it's time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Do you know what this is talking about? The Shemitah year. What happens? The Shemitah year, the land lays fallow. You don't till it, you don't work it. So after a whole year, fallow ground is ground that hasn't been tilled for like a year. So he says, what do you do? You can't just throw your seed this next year and expect to harvest if you don't break up the fallow ground. So he's saying, you got to prepare your soil, which is our bodies in one sense. We got to prepare our hearts, okay, to receive the word. But all of this comes from the Tanakh. And it says, it's time to seek the Lord. Do you know there is times when you don't seek the Lord because he's not going to be found? Just like the mother tells the child, the child says, hey, could you do this for me? And she says, you have to wait till dad comes home. Or dad may say, you have to wait till mom comes home. There's a time when the Lord is at work and he's not gonna be there for you to talk to. So we have to understand, we have to seek the Lord when he can be found. And there are specific times and seasons when you know he can be found. And then in Matthew 13, 7 through 9, it talks about how some fell among thorns and the thorns sprung up and choked them, but other fell onto good ground and brought forth fruit, a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Again, look at Jeremiah 4, 3. Thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and don't sow among thorns. Now, that might have been a dark saying of old. What do you mean? Don't break up my fallow gown. Don't sow among thorns. And Yeshua says, look, I'm talking about the word of God is the seed. Okay. And you need to break up your fallow ground in your heart to receive the seed. And then what's going to happen? It's good. You're going to bring forth fruit. 30, 60, 100 fold. We know the Torah, the Bible says we're supposed to bear fruit. You can only bear fruit if you receive a seed. And it's got to be the word of God is the seed. Look at Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. When do you seek the Lord? It says right here, while he may be found, which implies there's times when he's not going to be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. The unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and then he'll have mercy on him and to our God and he will abundantly pardon. Well, look how Isaiah 55 continues. And verse 10 and 11, as the rain comes down and rain always speaks of blessings. So this is talking about as the blessings come, but as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and returns not, but it waters the earth and makes it to bring forth and bud that it may give what? Seed to the sower. When Yeshua is talking about a man sowing seed, he's referring directly back to Isaiah 55. It says, may he give seed to the sower, bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. Okay, seed is the word of God. Okay, that's what he's talking about. Now, let me ask you this. All of the prophets that heard from God, they would see visions. They would have dreams, okay, like Daniel and Ezekiel, all these prophets. 
The only one that is different is Moses. Moses talked to God face to face, mouth to mouth. Moses was the scribe, but the first five books, the Torah, are the only books that are only God's word. Moses did not add one word to that book. Moses only wrote God's word. So that means the more you understand and read the Torah, which is only the creator's words, you get that planted in you. If you're good soil, you're going to produce all kinds of fruit. Do you see why Satan doesn't want anyone to read the Torah? Because those are the only words that come from directly from God without inspiration, without anything. I mean, think about this. The creator of this whole universe literally gave us his words. Why don't we want to devour them? Just like a love letter. You write a love letter to someone and oh my goodness, you're so excited. You stay up all night and you can read it and read it and read it and read it. Well, the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That means the whole Torah is actually a love letter. God's revealing himself to us. So in Jewish thought, this verse describes the study of Torah. God's word is the seed and the Torah has always been likened to rain. So when the rain comes down, that refers to the Torah coming down, which is what happened in our Torah portion. Okay, and then it says, it will not return to me void, but it will accomplish which I please and it will prosper the thing that I sent it. So God's word he brought to earth so we can absorb it. And when you absorb it, it will not return to him void, but it will accomplish the fruit that you need in your life. Man, we should be reading the Torah every day because that's God's word. That's the seed he's planting in you so you can produce the fruit. If you don't read it, you'll have nothing to produce the fruit or it won't be his seed. It'll be the own, just like GMO. How many of you heard of GMO? What is that? Genetically modified organism. Okay. How many of you know they're modifying your food? That means man is putting his stuff into, I believe many Bibles are GMO. How many English translations are there? Hundreds, thousands, thousands of English translation. But do you know in all of history, there's only been one Hebrew translation? One. Why? You can't change it. God said, don't you change one jot, one tittle, nothing. So here we have thousands of English translations. I don't know how many other languages it's in, but there's only one Hebrew translation and it can't be changed. This is why it's good to understand the Hebrew, because then you see when you have a hundred different English translations and they're all different while well, they're all wrong. Okay. The parable of the sower really is wrong title. It should be called the parable of the hearers. Okay. And there's four different types of hearers. Uh, we know the sower is the preacher. We know the seed is the word of God and think Torah. Uh, but the parable really is about four different types of people who receive the seed or hear the truth and their responses and the resulting harvest or lack thereof. There's four. There's the wayside the stony places, the thorns, and the good ground. Well, when you see the Jewish background of this parable, the number four is always just like north, south, and east, and west. At Passover, you've got the four cups and you have the four types of uh, kids. Uh, you have unclean fish, clean fish, fish from the Jordan, and fish from the Mediterranean. They say uh, one of the four types of disciples one of them is someone who studies, but they don't understand. The second one is someone who studies and does understand. The third one is a scholar who studies the scripture, understands it, but doesn't know how to communicate it or debate effectively. Then there's a scholar who studies the scripture, he understands it, and he can debate effectively. Okay, so the key is when they hear this, they know it has to do with putting the Torah into practice. So understanding always comes with doing. What Yeshua was doing was calling his uh, disciples to put his teaching into practice because one must hear and obey. Hearing alone is not enough. 
Now let's look at Matthew 13, verse 13 through 16. Yeshua says, therefore, I speak to them in parables because they seeing, they still don't see. They hear and they don't hear. Neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, by hearing you'll hear and not understand and seeing you'll see and not perceive. Then he says, this people's heart is wax gross. Their ears are dull of hearing. Their eyes, they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and then they'd be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. How, you know, how many times have you seen that little video, you know, of the monkeys, and they're like this, you know, or whatever, uh, or sometimes wants to tell you something. You want to tell somebody something, and they go like this, or they go like this. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Okay, or I don't want to see it, or I don't want to know it. Uh, that's the way the people were that he's talking about. They see it, but they don't want to see it. They hear it, but they don't want to understand it. How often do we say, do you hear me? You know, for, here's a great example. Talk about uh, a man not understanding a woman or not caring. Let's say, for example, the husband or the wife says to the husband, will you turn that stupid TV off? So he goes, okay, and he turns it off and he grabs the newspaper and sits down and starts reading it. Now, is that dumb or what? <laughs> I mean, the, the point isn't turn the TV off. The point is let's spend time together. Let's do something. They can hear it, but they don't have a clue. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay, you hear, but you're not getting it. And the reason they're not getting it is because they don't want to get it. Do you get it? Yes. Okay. Let's look at Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. This is where Matthew comes from. Everything in the New Testament, I can point to something in the Old Testament where it is expounded on. Isaiah 6, 9, and 10, he said, Go tell the people, hear indeed, but understand not. See indeed, but don't perceive it. Make the heart of the people fat, make their ears heavy, shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, they hear with their ears, they understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. In other words, he's saying you hear it, but you don't get it. You see it, but you don't get it. Both Isaiah and Yeshua did want the listeners to be healed, but this would only happen if they put what they're hearing into practice. And not everyone was willing to hear and obey. You know, I can't help but think of so many churches where the pastors are life coaches. All they want to do is make the people feel good and massage them and think, oh, you're, you're the worst sinner in the world, but guess what? It's okay. Jesus loves you. <laughs> and they don't get the people to hear and obey. The parable of the hearers is a parable of the harvest. Those who hear and obey are the ones who will produce much fruit. Look at Matthew 13, 31. Another parable he put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and he sowed in his field, which indeed is the smallest of all seeds. But when it is grown, it becomes the greatest. It becomes a tree so the birds of the air can come and lodge in the branches. So here I have an herb garden and there's some, you know, pretty tall herbs in some of those places. But here is the mustard seed. It is taller than a man can reach. It goes up to nine to 10 feet tall. Here it's the smallest of the herb, but it grows into the largest. And this goes back again to the parable that I spoke about in Luke, where the disciples come to the Messiah and they say, increase our faith. And what does the Messiah say, well, if you had faith as a mustard seed, you could sell this mountain to go jump in the lake and to go jump in the lake. So what did he do? He said, I don't need to increase your faith. This is where much of the church misunderstands it. They have all these teachings on mustard seed and they don't look at the text. He says, I don't need to increase your faith. If you had faith as a mustard seed, you could achieve all of these things. The problem was you don't know how to operate your faith. Just like if you have a computer with all this RAM and you're not using it and you go tell someone you need more RAM, you don't need more RAM. You need to know how to operate what you have. And so what the Lord is saying concerning the mustard seed and faith, you don't need more faith. You don't know how to operate the little faith you have. 
And then he goes on and tells them how to operate their faith. And we know from Galatians 5, 13, it says your faith operates through love. That's why there's faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love because it's the key to operate the other two. What good does it do if you have a car and no keys? You can, he says, you can have faith like mountains. You can have faith to remove mountains. But if you don't have love, it's no good because you can't operate it. How would you like to have all this faith when you can't operate it? How would you like to have a big fancy car and you can't operate it? So the, the point is we have to learn how to operate the faith that we have. That's the answer to the parable. Amen? Okay, that's a little story about the Jewish thought of the parables. Let's stand, we'll close with prayer, and then we'll see you next week.